Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. All hearts and minds on the Lord. The Heavenly Father, God, we love you, God. We thank you today, God. We give you praise. We give you glory, God, and we give you honor, Father God. We thank you for this day, this opportunity, this time, Father God, and this season, Father God. We thank you for what you're doing in this season, God. We thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that no matter what's going on, Father God, you have not removed your hand from us. So God, we thank you right now, God. We thank you for your son, Jesus, God. We thank you, Father God, for what, what he did for us, Father God. We thank you that you gave your only begotten son, Father God, that we might have an opportunity to be saved. So we thank you right now, God. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, Father God. We thank you for our God, our ruler, our teacher, God. We give you praise right now for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God. And so right now in this, in this place, God, we say, have your way, God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place, God, even though we might be geographically separated, Father God, we welcome you in the midst, Father God, tonight, God. We say illuminate the word that it might, and, and it touched hearts, Father God, change minds, Father God. Father God, and we thank you that we'll walk this thing out, Father God. We won't be just hearers of the word, Father God, but we'll also be doers of the word. So we thank you right now. Thank you for every heart, mind that is on this call tonight. God, we thank you for our bishop, Father God. We thank you for him, Father God, the teaching, Father God, the revelatory word, Father God, that you're giving, Father God. We thank you for the boldness to preach the, the, the unadulterated gospel, Father God. So we thank you for him, Father God, and what you're doing. We thank you for First Lady Thuston. We give praise, honor, and glory for her, Father God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for every clergy on this call right now, Father God. Uh, for their service, Father God, that they put their hands to the plow, Father God, and refuse to look back. So we thank you right now for them, Father God. So Lord, we say, have your way. We remove self out of the way, Father God, and say, you be God tonight and in our lives, Father God. So we give you praise. We give you glory and we give you the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, amen, and amen. All right, Brother Barclay, go on and say something for the Lord. You you led us into that great prayer. Tell us what the Lord is, tell us what word is in your spirit. What has he put in your spirit from his word? Hey, Amen. Uh, wow, you you put me right on the spot, Bishop. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> absolutely. Well, listen, I, I am just, uh, man, I am, I'm floored by what God is doing in this season, Father God. I thank God for what he's doing. Um, you know, just in the lives of his people. I mean, many of the testimonies that I'm hearing already, um, you know, everything hasn't been perfect. We've had some, some, some losses, Father God, and we, we've had some, some, some things that have, have not necessarily gone the way we thought they should. But uh, I am absolutely seeing the hand of God in the lives of his people, Father God. And uh, even during this prayer train, Father God, even during this consecrated period, Father God, I'm hearing some amazing testimonies of how God is just, just opening up his word and people are walking some things out. So for me, uh, Bishop, that's where I, I just reside. Uh, you know, I was out in, in St. Louis uh, out that way doing some work and I got kind of caught in that storm. And as I was driving back, I had to go a little slower than I, than I could. And it was amazing how in that period of time, um, I forgot to turn my radio on, but after about 30, 45 minutes into the ride, I, I didn't even realize it wasn't on. And it was just a, an opportunity to be so disconnected because, you know, I had to be careful about the drive and being on the ice. And, and you know, so no phone, no nothing was on. I'm just going down 70 and I'm seeing cars in the ditches. But it was such an, a great opportunity to disconnect from stuff and just ride and just talk and commune with God. And, and in that in that time, God is just, I mean, just having that, that disconnect. And that was just a reminder that sometimes we've got to be mindful of disconnecting from the stuff, the noise, the TVs, the, the news that's saying so much stuff that's bad, that's got our focus in the wrong place. So in this season, I want to be like David when he was a young man facing Goliath. The, the challenge of Goliath was a very real challenge. It wasn't uh, that Goliath wasn't mighty and it wasn't that Goliath wasn't large and he wasn't huge. He really was a, a worthy opponent, but David walked on the scene and all he could see was God. And all he looked, when he looked at even the, the, the thing that was standing and looming. So as we see things like COVID and we see things like, you know, rumors of wars and we're seeing things like, you know, our politicians and things that don't seem to be right. If we stay focused on those things, we'll forget that we serve a mighty God who is able to conquer any giant, any foe, any obstacle, any Anything that we might come against, we serve a mighty God. And if we just keep the faith and keep our lives to the heel, we come with our strength, we can overcome anything. 
and that's just where my heart is in this bishop. So I, I, I relinquish my time. You know, you can't give a preacher no time. We'll get the preacher, so I'm gonna give it back to you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, absolutely, Bishop. Thank Man. you for the time. Amen. 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 Um, that is a blessing. That's a blessing. That's such a blessing. Um, while we're while we're in the spirit of meditation i want you to go to psalm 119 psalm 119 that's the longest passage in the bible and um it's fascinating you ought to put that on your do list for this winter um is to just read that whole psalm i doubt you'll read it all in one setting um, there are over 100 verses, and that's the longest passage in all of God's word, and it's that way by design. In fact, at every eight verses, you'll see a word at the dividing point or the transitional point, and just, just as you study that, those words are not words, but at every one of those eight verses, you'll see what appears to be a word. What that is, is the pronunciation of a Hebrew alphabet. Because Psalms 119 was, um, was recorded and it was printed by the ancient scribes for memory for memorization purposes. And so uh, there are 22 words in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, 26 in the English alphabet. And so each one of those sections is introduced by another letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So it looks like a word, but it's really the pronunciation. And without going too deep, I see myself going deep in that, because when most of the Hebrew people began to read the Bible, they had moved and they had been exiled and taken into captivity in Babylon, um, which later was overtaken by Persia. And therefore, most of them had lost the fluency of the Hebrew language. And they began to speak Greek which was the language that followed the, um, um, the Persian world domination. They went from Babylonian to Persian, to, from Greece to Rome. And then we're into the um, Middle Ages, so to speak, following that. But the point is they began to speak Greek and many of them had lost the memory and the fluency of their language Hebrew. And so as the scribes begin to copy the word of God that was in Hebrew, they wanted the children not to forget this powerful passage. And this was their way of really learning their alphabet. And so by the time you get to Psalm 119 and verse 105, you see at the beginning of that is the word N-U-N. Um, and you probably would pronounce it the way they wanted you to pronounce it correctly, which is nun or none. Uh, and that is equivalent, as close as you can be equivalent in another language, that is equivalent to guess what letter. Just take a wild guess. What letter do you think that might be equivalent to pronounced nun? Yep, you got it. N. Of course, again, we're, I don't want to go too deep into language um, flavor, except to say, whenever you would say in, then people would immediately quote Psalm 105 to 112. That was like a memory device. And so by the time um, you get to the word, one Psalm, uh, verse 129, you see pe, or some pronounce it fe depending on what dialect. So they would immediately quote 129 to 136. Let me see if I got the right number. 
see, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112. I think I'm pretty right. Is that eight verses? So this, whenever you would say the letter none or in, immediately those that have been raised in a Hebrew family would start to quote or sing because each one of these sections is also a passage of a song. It's a um, verse of a song with all of these eight verses. So they would either sing because it had a tune. They would play if they had an instrument. Uh, they would remember if they were listening or they would quote everything in 105 to 112. That would be a trigger so that they would not forget the word of God. And Psalm 105 takes you right into the whole purpose for this memory device. Oh, by the way, this was used for children because children, their memory was the at its greatest capacity. So by the time you got to be older, you would have already incorporated into your mind, into your spirit, into your life, the word of God, which would give you a tremendous advantage of living victoriously in the covenant of God's word. So Psalm 119 and 105, we're not going to try to cover this whole Psalm tonight, but will you just, um, Read that verse, the 105th verse of Psalm 119. All right. Um, can you read that? Since you're off to a good start, Brother Barkley, read that verse. Psalms 119 to 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wow. I wish if it was left up to me, we would spend the rest of this evening, the next hour, just talking about how the word brings illumination. Thy word, not the word, but your word. Well, like all Psalms, that's a clue that this is a prayer because who is this verse addressed to? Thy would be thee, thee would be he. I'm not talking to myself. The only audience is the one who is the source of the word, your word. He's talking to God. This is a prayer language. He's talking to God about the incomparable power of his word. I'm getting happy right now. I'm, I really feel the illumination of the Holy Ghost right now. The enemy does not want you to appreciate the incomparable power of his word. And the psalmist said, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the source of my understanding. This is the source of my direction. This is the source of my joy. This is the source of my development. This is the, so I mean, it is a lamp unto my feet. And my feet would never go in the right direction without the illumination, the light of your word. And it is a light unto my path. This is my guide for life. And Brother Barkley, as you were sharing your experience with the Lord as you were returning on the highway, uh, that actually ties in with that verse, I think. That if you can just clear your mind of the clutter of this world, if you can make that a practice to flush from your soul and from your thinking, all of the filth, the pollution, and the fakeness, the lies, 
and the distortions that just cloud our world and zero in on the word of God. My God, it will give you direction for your feet and illumination for your life. That's why we call this meditation. And that's why the enemy is mad right now that you made it. Because he knows he's in great defeat for any believer that is being guided by the pure, unadulterated, word of God. It doesn't mean that everything, and Brother Barkley is correct, it doesn't mean that everything is pleasant. It doesn't mean that you are a lucky person. We know luck is a lie. It doesn't mean that you get everything you wish for. No. It doesn't mean that you've made it to heaven, where we are in paradise and unending happiness for eternity and the fullness of all joy shared with all those in glory. Well, no, we're not there yet. We are in an evil world that was made good, that has been cursed by the sin of man. But in the midst of this dark, often grossly dark world, God's word shines incomparably. And the psalmist said, while I'm praying, out of all the things I'm going to pray about, I'm going to pray about the gift of your word. Your word is just what I need. And it's what everyone needs. It is a lamp unto my feet. And your word is a light under my pathway. Hey, why don't you just take about 10 seconds and praise the Lord for his word. Go on and praise him. Open your mouth. Bring your hands together, open your spirit, and let's glorify God who's given us his eternal word that shall last forever. Forever. Everybody say forever. Say it again. Forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but thy word shall never pass away. Jesus said, Jesus said, my word shall never pass away, but it abideth forever. Um, y'all y'all ready, y'all ready to go a little further tonight? Well, that was a I think a blessed study we did on the letters of Paul. And you you can use that as one of your uh guides and um, launching a pads for later on this year, you could continue to go through the letters of Paul. I knew that was going to be a blessing. It was a greater blessing than what we thought. I want, we're, we're going to go to a topic. And when you do meditation of the Lord's word, there are two, um, yea, three basic methods you can use. Uh, the one that we just finished on the letters of Paul, where we are going from a letter to letter, from book to book, from scripture to scripture, um, is called an, um, um, a textual study. You study the word by looking at a section of the text. Some call it expositional. But it's when you take a letter or a chapter or a book, or in this case, a section, and you just dig in that particular section. And so you are studying a section of the scriptures and you go deeper and deeper and go layer by layer until you have explored um, the gospel of John or the book of Esther. That's a text of the scripture where you are um, going for the um, extracting you're on a search in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, maybe the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord's Prayer. It can be a section, it can be a chapter, it can be a book, it can be a group of books, such as we just did with Paul. The other, set, the other approach that we're going to use tonight is topical. 
So you have textual and then you have topical. And topical is when you take a particular topic and you don't just limit it to one passage, but you search throughout the scripture to glean what is there in various passages on that topic. And from that, you glean a grasp of what the word of God says on that topic. Some say that textual is the vertical and topical is the horizontal approach to studying the word of God. The vertical is where you go in one location, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And whatever comes up from that, is pure gold and the topical is when you go wider and wider and wider and you gain more information than you would have um otherwise and anywhere you go just like it was gold going in the vertical direction of the textual um when you go topical you get the breeze and the warmth of going from mountain to mountain and from valley to valley and from seashore to seashore. So you get the tapestry and the wind and the breeze. The third, the third is one that I don't recommend the most, but it's okay. And that is the, um, they call it random. I use the term spontaneous where you say, I don't know whether I'm gonna go topical or textual. I'm just gonna open up the Bible and whatever it opens to, I'm jumping in there because I know it's going to be, it's going to be soothing, it's going to be refreshing, it's going to be antiseptic, it's going to be medicine, it's going to be power. So I'm just going to open up the Bible and wherever it opens, whatever, whatever my eyes fall on, uh, is going to be good. And uh, that's another approach. There's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes that works out well. But uh, those are the three fundamental approaches to Bible study or meditation. Um, we just took one passage from Psalm 119. We could have gone throughout that psalm and see what we gain from the longest passage in the Bible. And we could take a whole month or two months or three months and study Psalm 119. That would be textual. And whatever comes from that text is so good, including the verse we just read, Psalm 10, verse 105. Or we could say, what I see here where it 105, and it's talking about um, light. Let's go through the rest of this passage and see where else light is referenced. Matter of fact, let's go throughout Psalm and see what it says about light. Matter of fact, why don't, why don't we go throughout um, everything that is attributed to David? Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel, or rather 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and see what it says about light. Um, matter of fact, why don't we just go into the New Testament and see what it says about it. either Either method is good, one's vertical, one's horizontal. It's wonderful if you have time and you take the time to do both. Now that would be number four, the combo, where you both a combination of the textual and the topical. Go to this passage and y'all are getting ready, y'all are getting ready to learn some things in the next few weeks. If I can get you to go to the um, um, gospel according to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're gonna to go topical, but we're, that will lead us into some textual. Mark chapter 12, and I want you to let me know if you get an idea what this topic will be for our study tonight and for the next few Thursdays. And I'm, I'm with you also, Ella. This has been a wonderful season of consecration. It's been blessed. Hey, Amen. It's been a blessing to me. I believe our church has been blessed. Um, I heard it this morning. I tuned in this morning. And it was glorious. And 
get your own train after Friday. We end this train on Friday, but get your own train and stay in your prayer time as we move into this new year, the second month. Mark chapter 12 and verse 17. Oh, verse 17. I'm not going to be doing all this teaching. I'm just setting it up. Uh, you all will be going even further. We're going to get some more experts along with the experts we have. But let me know if you figure out what this topic is. Mark chapter 12 and verse 17. Uh, Sister Latrice Holiday, look like I see you. I see numbers more than I see faces. So I got to, I have to try to hope I know who that is. If you have your Bible near you, uh, Sister Latrice Holiday, can you read that verse, the 12th chapter of Mark and the 17th verse? And Jesus answering said unto them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Oh, my goodness. I'm about to pick on you a minute. I'm going to give you a fair warning. What in the world do you think Jesus was referring to now? Before she answers that, I want you to think about that. Now, we are at a place, and verse 16 gives us the clue, um, where a coin is brought to Jesus at his request. And um, in verse 14, matter of fact, verse 13 and 14, you see the backdrop. It's a trap. It's a trap. Verse 13, Pharisees and sort of the Herodians came to catch Jesus in his words. That's pretty low down, isn't it? Trying to entrap the savior of the world. I mean, how low can you go to double team him now the Herodians and the Pharisees were antagonistic towards each other. They didn't get along. They were rivals, different, you might say political parties. And the Herodians, they were loyalists to the fake king, the puppet politician, Herod. And the Pharisees were the legalists. They were loyal to the chief priest, but they came together. They came out of fighting each other to team up on Jesus. We can't catch him on our own. So we're going to double team Jesus to try to trick the one who comes to save you. That's, that's interesting. To try to trick the one who comes to heal you. To try to trick the one in a trap who's come to give you truth and genuine understanding. And watch how Jesus dealt with those who came to set him up for the key. And when they would come, verse 14, they asked him a trick question. So any answer he would give, they thought would be to his um, discredit. Master, we know you are true. Lying. They didn't believe he was true. Trying to set him up, get in his head. You don't care about anybody. Nobody has impressed you. Uh, you don't regard the person of men, but you teach the way of God in truth. They didn't believe that. They're talking trash, trying to get his guard down. Now, just watch because what happens to Jesus is going to be a pattern for what will happen to us. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? A trap, a trick, a setup, so that any answer they could imagine, they would use that to indict him. Oh, keep it real. They wanted him out of here. They wanted him to be arrested. They wanted him to be abused. 
and beaten. They eventually they actually wanted him eventually to die and for it to look like their hands were clean and they had nothing to do with it. This is the, this is this is this is the hustle that they're running. So they ask him, how about paying taxes? Is it lawful to give tribute, which in another translation will say paying taxes to the government. Caesar was equivalent to the president or the king. He was the emperor of the Roman Empire of which Israel was under their oppression or under their control. So if he said, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, that would sound like he's encouraging slavery and oppression and wickedness against his own people. If he said, no, don't pay taxes, it would sound like he is an insurrectionist, like he is a part of a coup, um, that he wants the empire to collapse and the people of Israel to be the victims. So either answer is a setup. Shall we give or shall we not give? But verse 15, get ready, get ready, get ready, Sister Latrice, get ready. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Now stop right there. How did Jesus know their hypocrisy? How could he know that? And he said unto them, I know y'all try to trip me. I know this is a trap. Why are you tempting me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. I want to ask you before Sister Latrice gives us our answer on what did Jesus have in mind when he gave the answer to the question, how did Jesus know that they were being deceitful, hypocritical, fake, false. How did how did they know that? What you think? What you what do you think, Brother Rivette? Do you have any clue on how Jesus knew that this was a trap of temptation? What you think? Glad to see you, Dr. Rivette. Good to see you, Bishop. Bishop, I'm just I'm just getting on here and I'm just trying to catch <laughs> on to what you all are talking about. I'm just trying to get caught up here. Good, good, good. I should have known that. Thank God you made it. All right. Um, Sister Barnes, what you got? What you think? What you think? Why? How did Jesus know that this was a double team? Well, I think, well, first of all, the Lord knows all things. So he knew um, already from their line of questioning what their motive was. Good. Yeah. Um, he knew that they were from their just from their disposition what they were trying to they were trying to do. Good, good. All right. That sounds good. That sounds real good. He knows what you would not naturally know. First lady, I think I saw your hand. I definitely want to hear your answer. I put it in the chat and I pretty much said what I, I pretty much said what Sister Bourne said that Jesus knew all things and he knew their hearts. He knew the, that their heart was was uh was not was not was not righteous. Okay, he just because he just knew he had that capacity to know everything. All right. We, we, we got we have to we have to receive that we have to receive that um let let me go to brother jones brother darwin jones brother darwin jones you ready how did jesus know that this was a hypocritical ploy uh yes sir bishop um you know how sometimes after we deal with certain people over a period of time we kind of figure out what they're all about. 
So I think he probably knew from his previous dealings with the Pharisees that they were up to no good. That was even from a human perspective. And, but as they've said already from a spiritual perspective, he is omniscient. But even from his previous dealings with them, he knew that they were up to no good. Okay. He had prior <coughs> history with them. So he was familiar with what they represented. That's very good. Very good. This, this may not have been his first encounter with this group. All right, Sister Jane A. Lewis, I see your hand. I want to hear you, Sister Jane A. How did Jesus know that they well, did no good? Okay, well, I don't know. I guess I thought when he uh, asked them to bring him the penny, and uh, when he brought the penny, I mean, he seen what was on the penny, and he said, what is this image? And they said unto him, it was Caesar. And so I, I guess my thought, um, my thought is for then he, he knew for a fact, you know, that um, they were answering to Caesar, you know what I'm saying, instead of, instead of the Lord. Good, good. How about this, Sister J.D.? How about this, Brother Jones? How, how about this, Sister Barnes? How about this, First Lady? How about this, Saints? Jesus was keenly aware that things are not always as they appear. Jesus was aware that what people may appear to intend is not always accurate. In other words, it's a lot of liars in America. He knew there are a lot of false pretenders. He knew humanity is tainted by evil ever since the fall. And what appears on the surface is very often not consistent what is in the heart. So Jesus, as you all have mentioned, all of you being the son of God, uh, he had access, access to all knowledge. Okay, so Jesus was a spiritual being. I want you to receive that. Jesus was a human, 100% human, but he was also 100% spiritual or divine. So Jesus was not only in tune with what people said and how they looked, and their emotions and their actions, but Jesus also knew you should always seek to discern the spirit of a person that you encounter. The spirit of a person is much more defining than the natural. In other words, they could have said something that would have been technically improper, but if their heart was pure, that would put them in the category of the righteous. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks always at the heart. So that may be a lesson for all of us that when you're dealing with people, especially those that want to get close to you, help me, Holy Ghost. It could be the salesman really not that concerned about you. His main concern is what do I have to do to make a sale? Nothing wrong with him selling whatever he's selling, but don't ever be confused about what's going on here. Um, for someone who seems to be friendly to you, we all have a attraction to those that are friendly towards us, but you never want to take all that at face value 
be spiritually minded. Maybe the person does want to be friendly towards you. But let that be the conclusion of your spiritual discernment. <laughs> Don't get into a car with strangers unless you've got some kind of no fault discernment that something good is going to happen. But until that time, especially you females, don't you get in no car with a stranger? The motive of the person is what Jesus tuned into. And look how he answered. Sister Jane A is correct. Jesus answered, not by saying, he didn't call them hypocrites, even though they were. He didn't even disrespect them, even though they were disrespectful. He didn't bust them out and expose the pollution of their nakedness, though he could have. He just said, go and get me some money, a penny. And when they brought it to them, when they brought it to him, he said, whose picture's on here? Whose image and whose superscription? And they said, the emperor's, Caesar's. All right, Sister Latrice, I hope you're ready now. Jesus answered and said unto them, these Herodians and these Pharisees, come on back, come on back. Who was reading that? Read that again, verse 17. What did Jesus say to them? And Jesus answering said unto them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. What's he talking about? What do you think? What do you think he has in mind, Sister Latrice? What do you think he's? What is he expressing? What does that mean? I think he's saying, "Obey the laws of the man, but also obey the laws of God." Good, good. The laws of man and their laws of God and obey them. Now, that is somebody who has just made a plunge into a topical study. What is the subject? Let me see anybody put in the chat. What is this topic about? I will go to the chat and see what you put. Uh, let me see what you have here. Um, Let's see here. Um, right, right, right. Uh, somebody said taxes. Somebody said money. You would be right on both of those. Money, uh, Brother Jones says, respecting the government. Yes, that's true. Um, anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Brother Jones. Tell us what you mean by respecting the government. Uh, yes, sir. So since they were citizens under Caesar and he was providing a place for them, part of the responsibility for them having that place provided was for them to pay taxes to the one who was providing it. So he showed them the coin so that they can recognize that they did have a responsibility to that person who was on that coin, who was the provider of the uh, land that they were living in. Okay, so when we talk about taxes, and you're both right on that, um, to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, that's not talking about go directly to Rome and bring him a, um, a check. He is talking about paying your taxes. And you pay your taxes with your money. And the question is, is it lawful to give your tribute or your taxes to Caesar or not? That was the question. And Jesus says, it's not a matter of either or. It's a matter of both and. You should pay your taxes 
but that does not mean that you endorse everything that Caesar does. It means you respect the fact that government is ordered by God and government is necessary for the proper management and order of society. And man in his unrighteous and imperfect and sinful state tends to be abusive or negligent with authority. So government should not be dishonored, but that does not mean that you are in agreement and you support everything the government does because there is a authority that is above the government. And so definitely don't neglect what you render to God because you pay your taxes. And because you pay your taxes does not mean you should neglect in any way your service to God. All right, Brother Jones, look like you're telling me something else. I want to hear you. Okay, Bishop, I was just going to point out that in the chat, uh, First Lady Thuston had, had kind of brought some clarity to it when she said, render the natural things to man and the spiritual things to God. They were uh, trying to see, it seems like they were trying to see if, if they were to put Caesar in God's place or God in Caesar's place by asking that particular question to trip him up. And like I said before, he knew from their previous dealings with the Pharisees, because he was talking to the Pharisees, that that's what they were all about, trying to trip him up. So it, it came down to, they were trying to get him to uh, respond in such a way they can say that uh, he wasn't honoring God, it appears. How about this, Brother Jones? How about this? How about this? Yes, sir. Anytime you get serious about money, get ready for a trap. Anytime you get serious about your money, be prepared for confusion. Anytime you really want to know what God says, not the Herodians, not the Pharisees, not the government, but what God says about your money. Get ready for the enemy to confuse the issue. And you're onto something there that when they ask him this question, it was designed to confuse the role and thus confuse the money because everybody knows that money can be that source that will make you or break you. And what I want you to do is join these Herodians and these Pharisees who got one thing right. They came to Jesus to get the answer. Now their motive was wrong. Their intentions were wrong. But look at the outcome. Let me go back to you, Sister Latrice. What's the last part of verse 17? What was the outcome? In verse 17, how did he conclude? And they marveled at him. They marveled at him. And verse 18, and we'll leave this then come unto him the Sadducees which say uh, there is no resurrection and they asked him a question. That was it for the Herodians. That was it for the Pharisees. Then another gang showed up and the Sadducees said, you know what? We're not going to ask him anything else about the taxes. We're not. Oh, no, no. That didn't come out the way we planned. We're not going to ask him anything else about money. Let's ask him about something else. 
I want you to get in your mind what someone has already put in the chat. What does the word of God say about your money? And it's personal too. And what does it say about my wife's money? <laughs> maybe that didn't come out right. Maybe, maybe, maybe I ought to say, what does the word say about my money? And I think we're going to find something right there is going to be a reference of this topic that I don't want you to ignore. Um, go to Deuteronomy chapter eight. We started with the gospel. Now we go to the Pentateuch, to the law, to the old covenant, to the original covenant. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Uh -huh. And verse a number um, a ten. Verse ten. Deuteronomy verse eight, <laughs> pardon, <coughs> pardon me. Elder Williams, good to see you tonight. Sister Williams, is that you, Sister Williams? Um, Sister Williams, can you read that passage, Deuteronomy verse eight and verse 10? Yes, sir, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Yeah, when thou hast eaten and art full, thou shalt bless the Lord, I'm excuse me, bless, Bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. Read that again. When thou hast eaten, are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Mm -hmm. Now, where did all of this come from? The land, the food, the nourishment, where did that come from? The Lord. Now, you, that came from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So when you get it and you are so full, mm -hmm. then what should you do? You're doing good, sister. What should you do after you have received so much from the Lord? What should you do? Bless, give him thanks. Praise yeah. him for his mighty acts. God has a habit of giving us more than what we need, not just mm -hmm. enough, but filled you. Mm -hmm. But that comes from him and that qualifies us to bless him. Now, would you go to verse 18? Mm -hmm. And read that. Yeah. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to give wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which is sore unto thee, thy father, thy fathers, as it is this day. What you want to say about that verse, sister? What you want to say about that verse? I say, Amen. <laughs> uh, he that give it, he that he may establish his covenant. Um God get all the praise. He gets all the praise. Good, good, good. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. I want this verse is going to be one of our pillar verses, both of these. Uh, read it one more time, verse 18. But thou shall remember. No, go back to verse 17. Get 17 and 18. They go together. We got to do 17 and 18. And thou shalt say in thy heart, my power. And the might of my hands have got, gotten me this wealth. Mm -hmm. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which is he swear unto the, thy fathers as, he, as it is this day. 
All right, I'm com I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to your sister, Crystal. I'm coming to your sister, Crystal. Um, what is that verse giving us as a lamp unto our feet? We're getting some guidance here. We're getting a light into our path. Uh, Brother Barkley, what you telling us on that? What you telling me, Brother Barkley? Wow, I, I was actually typing in the in the in the chat and misspelled it. I got so excited. You know how sometimes you just misspell because you've been in such a hurry. Uh, I'm a talker, not a texter, I promise you. But uh, I was so glad you went back to 17 and, and asked her to go back and read that because I think that connects so greatly to what you were talking about earlier when you were saying when we were talking about how Jesus and the heart, right? So, you know, it, it, it begins with, and thou saith in thine heart. It already goes into the perception of what the heart thinks, right? And the heart perceiving that the money and the power that you get in its mind, and I got this. But the reminder is, 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 but it was God that gave you the power to be able to get the wealth and the wealth belongs to God. And, and so, again, when we're talking about Jesus perceiving the heart of the Pharisees and, and them and the money and trying to trip him up, it just goes to show you that Jesus is, in my opinion, I mean, my degree is sociology. And so, you know, the study of people and groups of, of things. And so, again, Jesus was one of the greatest sociologists that ever lived and that he could understand how. You say what up? Did you say what up? I think, well, let me, let me take that back. You're right. You're right. Yeah, he take is, that back. Take that he back. is the greatest sociologist of all time uh, in that he could, you know, would, would perceive, you know, these groups of people and these men and in the, in the region that he was, he understood the people he was dealing with. Um, and so, you know, both understanding that he was all man and all deity. He, listen, my God was awesome. He was awesome. He was awesome and is awesome and continues to be awesome. Uh, and I just marvel at, at his ability to be able to perceive, you know, even the heart of man. Um, but I, I think this is a great connective scripture for what we were talking about just a little bit earlier, you know, to, talking about the heart and how we get, you know, because once we start getting our money, we start to think it's all about me. It's all about us. We've arrived. We've attained. We got it. We, we all that in the bag of potato chips. At the end of the day, it is all God, it is all God that gives us the power, the strength, the mind, the ability um, to, to go out and do the things that we do. So we've got to always honor and praise him. Amen. Very good. All right, Sister Belinda, man, what you get out of that verse? What you get out of that verse? I saw your mind moving. What you get out of that verse, Sister Madden? I, I placed it in the chat. We just have to remember who, the who provides, who is our provider. And you talk about light. Um, the more we learn of God and the more we read of his word and it gives us light in who's providing, the light comes on and it shines down and it says, this is where you got it from. This is who provides it. And so when we know the who, we really understand the light of God. And that's that light that lights our path and provides us with what we need. We talk about what we eat, what we make, whatever our resources may be. When the light comes on, we really recognize who is giving us what we need, whatever our resources may be. The operative word there, Sister Madden, that you're referring to is covenant. Yes, we should remember, but what we should remember is the relationship between the wealth and the wealth giver. And the relationship is covenant, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto your fathers as it is this day, is there anybody here who does not want wealth? I, I just want you to think about that. You can go to the chat if you like, but is there any one of you says, one thing I don't want is any more money. I want less money. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about after taxes. I'm a taxpayer and I don't want, I don't want that reference to get far away out, out of my memory. Believers should pay taxes. It does not make you righteous by not paying taxes. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, he didn't say give him more. So I try to get every deduction and every exemption. 
did you go? See, I think the government. Well, heard praise him. the Lord. I think the government heard him teaching on taxes. He, 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 <laughs> there he is. There he is. That where is he, Bishop? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Bishop. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Unmute okay. yourself, Bishop. Unmute yourself, Bishop. Unmute yourself. Text. We can't. He can't hear us. We can't. We can't hear you, Bishop. And we can't hear you because. Okay, did y'all hear what that, I just said? No, no. What? No. Oh, Not a yeah. word. Uh, you were saying a lot, but we didn't. I said the enemy tried to cause me to lose my backup, but I had a backup tonight. He couldn't stop. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and part of that backup is I want to be guilty of following my Savior and paying my taxes even though I do not agree with everything that the government does with it. I do believe that Christ set the example that in spite of it being imperfect, in spite of it having purposes that we disagree with and many things that are unrighteous, believers should not be against their government, should not go to the Capitol building on January the 6th and try to take it over because you didn't get who you wanted to be the president. We shouldn't declare the elections as all a fraud and to bring tumult and uh, chaos in our nation and make us vulnerable to our enemies. Uh, that's wrong. That is not the example of our Savior. But at the same time, I don't want to give Caesar anything that doesn't belong to him. I want every deduction. I want every exemption. And I'm not trying to make more work for Sister Molden or Sister <laughs> Michelle Johnson and certainly not Sister Ruthie Fields. I want my statement that I gave some money to the church. I'm the number one giver in the church and I'm glad and I want that to go on my income tax return. I want whatever deduction I can get because I can do more for the Lord if I get my deduction. And I, I, I know that that's not the purpose but anything, including my gift to the church of my tithes and offering, that is deductible from the taxes that I believe I'm right in claiming. Now, they have their own system. Sister Phil's got a good system, so don't all y'all gang her at one time, gang up on her one time. But I feel wonderful to be in a country where we get credit for giving money to the church that would go to the government. Uh, let me get off of that, except to say that money is something that I don't, I'm going to check, let me double check the chat. And I ask you, is anybody who does not want to have more money, you want to have less? Uh, I don't see anybody. And I'm glad that you're not lying because if anybody said they want less money, I know you either didn't understand the question or you need to be delivered from a lying spirit. <laughs> I already know that. Why don't y'all say, this is not a church of liars. Why don't y'all lift your hand and say, thank God this is not a church of liars. <laughs> and guess what? You're not following a pastor who's a liar. I want every dime that God wants me to have. I want it all. Yes, I do. I want every dime. I hope I'm not being too transparent. I'm not going to rob anybody. I'm not going to mistreat anybody. I'm going to tell you what I'm delivered from. I'm not going to be jealous of anybody who has more or less. I'm not envious of not a one person in this church do I have envy towards. I'm glad when you get your money. I'm glad when you get blessed. I'm glad when the Lord smiles on you. I'm glad when he gives you power to get wealth because that is not limited to one person. This is to establish his covenant 
that he swear unto our fathers before us. This is for anyone who is in the covenant. So let, let I think we can move on from the place where we are opposed to an increase. Well, that brings us to two concerns. Uh, number one, what is wealth? What is wealth? And uh, we, we're going to try to get, I'm, there's a lot in the chat tonight, and I'm glad because this is a topic that applies to all <clears throat> of us. Uh, but if you want to go to the chat, put in what is wealth. Brother, Dr. Rivet, tell us something about that. Uh, well, actually, <clears throat> Bishop, I was going to say before you got off the subject of verse, unmute, uh, unmute. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Can you hear me, Bishop? Okay. okay. I was going Go to say, I was going to say, Bishop, uh, before we got off the subject here on verse 17 and verse 18, I always look at uh, verses in the Old Testament and try to connect them to verses in the New Testament. And this kind of coincides a little bit with John 15 and 5, where the Lord, um, you know, was very blunt. You know, when he said that, you know, I am the vine and you are the branch and without me, you can do nothing. And it was very, kind of very blunt with that. And this kind of, I was just saying that verse 17 and verse 18 kind of coincide with uh, what he uh, said in uh, John 15 and 5. Very good. What do you think wealth means? What does that term mean, wealth? Uh, wealth is, it could be, actually it's, you know, something land or money or something that was handed down uh, from generation to generation uh, to, to you. Uh, something, that, something that's being passed on, not always just don't have to be money, it would be uh, land or other valuable possessions or whatever, something that was passed on, been passed on from generation to generation. Good. Um, someone says in the chat is the blessings of God. Um, wealth is abundance. Wealth could mean plenty, uh, overabundance, wealth. God, God is the giver of wealth. Now, let, let's 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 uh, jump to the fundamentals of wealth. Wealth is natural, and wealth is spiritual. There are different qualities of wealth. Um, wealth can be physical. Wealth can be artistic. Wealth can be emotional. Wealth can be relationship. I feel wealth right now. My wife is studying the Bible. My daughter's studying the Bible. I think I saw a sister studying the Bible. That's wealth, to have people that you're related to in your family that are addicted to the word of God. You, you, I, I don't think you can put a price on that. And then you, you're my family. To have 35, 40 lines with other people that have blocked out an hour and a half tonight just to meditate on the word of God. That's, to me, I consider our church a wealthy church because there is a love for the word of God, for the truth of the Lord, for his revelation, for the fellowship, for the worship. Uh, just this week, we started to be in a testing center in our community. Every day, beginning next week, I call that a wealthy church. That's a giving church. We just sent money from our meager funds to the foreign field. That's wealth. What y'all do on Sunday? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's wealth. Wealth is also having peace, satisfaction, tranquility, seeing your life is going somewhere, your body being healed, health physically and naturally. I have seen the Lord do this more times than I even want to tell you. Take my enemies and literally make them a footstool. 
in a way that only God can. Yeah, so wealth is, it can be monetary, Dr. Rivette is right. It can be land, it can be a um, family inheritance. It can be the fruit of your labor, but please don't leave out your greatest wealth is spiritual wealth. So wealth is more than your necessities. Wealth is more than the minimum. Wealth is an abundance. So it is a desirable resource that you have more than enough to share. My God Almighty, I feel the Lord happy. I feel happiness in my soul right now. If you've got any spiritual, lift your hand and say, thank God for this wealth. Don't hate it. Don't hate it. Don't cheapen it. Don't act like it's not important because some people get wealth that did not come from God. All wealth does not come from God. It does not. The, 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 the crack dealer can have a lot of money. God didn't give that to him. He got it, but that didn't come from God. God did not give you what you stole from somebody. It didn't come from God. But this passage says to the covenant people, remember the Lord your God, he gave you power to get wealth. So the next, the next concern would be, what do you do with the power? Because in this passage, he doesn't just give it to you, but he gives you power to, some, one translation says, to receive it or to pursue it, to grasp it when it's before you. And often when it comes to wealth, we expect God to do it all, but here it says he gives you the ability. He gives you the opportunity. He gives you power to get it. There is wealth, but now the way God prefers to deal with us is to give us power to get what he has provided. Mm, 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 mm. That is in contrast to verse 17. It's easy to say when you're doing well that my power and my hand, my might has gotten me this wealth. Many times wealth destroys people because they have not prepared themselves with the lamp unto our feet and the light unto your pathway. Can you just consider this? Um, for many people, they cannot be trusted with what God has for them. They can't be trusted. As soon as God gives them wealth or a blessing or something beyond what they expected, just what it says in verse 17, they become the center of the entire canvas. And they end up saying in their heart, maybe they would never say it with their mouth, I did this, I got this, I earned this, I invested this, I saved this, I figured this out. My power and the might of my hand has gotten this wealth. It was my family, my grandmother, my, wait a minute, wait a minute, y'all. Me being a Scorpio, I did that because of my um, Zodiac sign. I just worked hard. And the scripture is showing us that when God gives you power, never take the credit and never abandon the purpose. And I'm leaving this at this passage, you're going to another one. But look at the purpose of him giving them power to get well. Can anybody identify what that, I wanna go, I wanna go to you, Sister Crystal. I wanna go to you. Does that verse tell us the purpose that God gives 
us power to get wealth. What is the purpose of that? Why does he do that? Uh, it looks like it says here that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. So for covenant. Do you know anything that's in that covenant? Blessings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But both natural and spiritual. Yes, yes. And who put the terms in the covenant? Where did the terms come from? This is like a contract. Where did mm -hmm. the terms of the covenant come from? From God. We don't establish the covenant. It's his covenant. God put the terms in there for this covenant. And he wants that established with us. That is the purpose of the wealth and the power to get it. And the word covenant, and I hope you make a note on this, is a relationship term a relationship concept. It's like a contract, except better. And it's based on God's relationship with his chosen people. This does not apply to everyone. I'm gonna go on and say it. Wealth that God has for the saints, my God, the wealth that God has for the saints would never work for the Gentile, it would never work for the unbeliever. Oh, they can get some money, no question about that. But the wealth that God gives you power is only for those that are in the covenant. And here's the, here's the oddity about that. It is possible to be in the covenant and be oblivious to the terms that it includes. Somebody say, say that again. Please say that again. It is possible and very common for God to have a covenant relationship with you and you are not even aware of what's in that covenant with your name on it. And I, I don't mean to pick on it because she's here, but um, I drew up my will not long after my daughter was born. And not one time, even today, she's an old woman now, but not one time have I opened up that will and showed her what's in it. Y'all think I should? You think I should or you think I shouldn't? What y'all think I ought to do? <laughs> well, that's been a long time ago. There was some provision Mom, what's in the will? Uh, <laughs> she's, she's, oh, he's not going to sign off tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Melanie. <laughs> Do you know what? There are terms in this. Co I'm coming down your. I'm coming down your alley. Don't there do are it. terms <laughs> in your covenant right now with God that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. because it's his covenant. Mm -hmm. You had nothing to do with the terms of it. He custom made this covenant with you in mind, and it's the same covenant that was with all of the believers before you. He's only tweaked it for your particular future. My God, everybody in the covenant has power over the enemy. Everyone in the covenant has power over disease. Everyone in the covenant has power over starvation. Mm. Everyone in the covenant has power over fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but in the covenant is power. Well, you just heard it. Power, power to what? Get wealth and love. Power over hate, power over grief, power over depression power over fear, power over deception, power over lies, power over defeat, 
power over self-loathing, power over poison, and power over all of the works of the enemy and a sound mind. The reason you never have to go insane is because a sound mind is in the covenant of every believer. Thank you, Jesus. And a lot more. Not only does the covenant tell you what what he has in the well, but the covenant also gives you the formulas. It gives you the keys to how, how to access it. He giveth you power to get well. And what am I reading? The perfection of need being met, whether it's emotional or spiritual, relational, financial, physical, only God can do that with perfection. He not only gives you the power, but in that formula, he also shows you how to access it, how to use it, how to increase it, and how to share it for the glory of God. One last verse. Our time is about up. Our time is about up. Our time is about up. One last passage. One last passage. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Now you have to include this in your understanding of what God said about your money. What God said about your money. First Timothy chapter six and um, verse 10, verse 10. All right, very good. Um, Sister Jane A, do you have that? Can you read that? First Timothy chapter six and verse 10. That'll be our final uh, passage tonight. First Timothy. Chapter six. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, let, let as many servants as are under the yoke. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter six. Not second. First Timothy okay. chapter six. Oh, okay. Verse one. Come on down to verse 10. Oh, come down. Okay. Come down to verse 10. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Right Stop now. right there. Since you went there, just realize he's now talking about those that do not have any wealth naturally in verse one. Servants under the yoke working for somebody. And he tells them, show them honor. And some of these were perhaps slaves. Most of these were servants, which meant they worked for somebody. And they mm -hmm. never, never could get free from the sharecropper. This was like a sharecropper rate. That's one end of the economy. Now come to verse 10 and you see the other. Read. Okay. okay. For the love of money is not the root of our evil. Better read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. For the love of money is the root of our evil. That's it. Read. Which while some convert it after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You get anything out of that, Sister Janie? Anything that anything <laughs> grab you there? Well, yeah, it's like money is not everything. And uh, when you do receive it, you know, it is a blessing and, you know, treat it as a blessing. You know, that um, if you treat it otherwise, then I think that's where the evil comes. So, um, you know, it's a blessing to have it, but also um, it's the root of, it can be the root of all evil, you know, depending on how you are using it. It's a blessing from God, but he doesn't want you to use it in ways that, you know, are not um, right. The problem with money and we just heard all of the wealth affirmations. But the problem with money, there's two problems with money, two problems. And you're probably familiar with one more than the other. One is not having enough. <laughs> oh, don't hear me, but I'm telling the truth. Yeah. That's a problem if you don't have enough. And we'll get to that in our meditation series before the month is over. 
it is not the will of God that your needs are unsupplied. And there are many believers, and you can't always tell from what it looks like on the outside. It's not always a good indicator, but many believers struggle with their needs being supplied. That is not the will of God. It's a reality, but that's not the will of God because my God shall supply all of your needs. But that's a problem for believers who don't have enough. The problem this passage refers to is those that desire it more than they desire the God of the covenant. I'm going to say that again. Um, I asked you earlier, how many of you all do not want any more money? How many of y'all want less wealth? Not one of you lied. All of us, if we're honest, we would be glad to have more than what we have. The problem is when we want money more than we want the God who gives it. Because when your love is more for the money than it is the Lord, evil has already infected your life, your soul, your spirit, and it all now has become a curse and a waste. In other words, you've got to be sure that as you become acquainted with the covenant that provides you power for wealth, that you never allow anything associated with that to become the source of your love, to have it and not love it. I'm gonna say that again. It's better not to have it than to have it and love it. And if you have not come to this covenant understanding, and guess what? Most people haven't. They say it, but you can see it time and time again as God begins to allow material blessings, people tend to become more spiritually malnourished. It's not only a problem, it is a curse. It is the root of all evil. And so you have to fight that temptation, that force, that seducing spirit, that addiction, that once you find the magic key, you just want more of that and neglect the covenant that gives you the purpose that he may establish the covenant with you that he already started with our fathers before us. That's what we're going to be exploring in the next few weeks. Um, what God said about money and how you can have it and your need supply and not love it. Have it and not love it. It become your servant rather than you become its slave. You can only do that by his word being a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And your greatest wealth is your Jesus wealth. Thank you, Jesus. Well, now let's give the Lord a, a praise. Let's give him a wealthy praise. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God. Let's get our offering and receive our offering. Brother Phil, I want you to bless the offering and give us the benediction tonight. Everybody share. I was looking at the report this week and you share on Thursday night and I'm glad that you do. So uh, use the cash app and use the um, give the five. If you just don't have it, you can do it on Sunday. The first Sunday is coming up. Uh, we're praying for uh, Sister Burke's family. Um, the Lord touched her and she had a wonderful night um, 
And then um, on today, I said yesterday, um, she went in from labor to reward. I was talking with uh, Brother Romel today, and I just thank God for the wealth. And though, um, no, we did, they didn't want to see their mother leave um, this soon. But Brother Romel was saying, I just am so glad for God in her life. And I'm glad she had some happiness right up until the end. And I'm glad she was the kind of mother who wanted good things for her children. I told Brother Romel and his family, that's the wealth that even in sadness and in loss, we see the hand of God and we see the goodness of the Lord. You're still sad. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. But we still see an opportunity to, in everything, we praise him and give him thanks. We lift up um, the entire family, and you'll be hearing more about that as we go forward. And, um, on Sunday is the first Sunday. Let it be a glorious day. You can bring the oil. We're going to bless the oil. It's, amen. We're going to open the doors of the church. This Sunday, let's be timely. I want us to be very timely. Sunday school is good. Bible ban on tomorrow. Um, we're in a consecration. We got one more train ride in the morning. I hope everybody that can will be on at 630 for the final day of this glorious consecration. I'm glad for y'all. I'm glad for what the Lord is doing in our midst. And the half has not yet been told. Praise the Lord. All minds clear. God bless. Let me be sure I'm not missing anything. Amen. Let's praise God for this meditation tonight. Go on and give him a hallelujah. Clap your hands and give hallelujah. him a hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise him. Hallelujah. Praise him. Yes, praise God. him. Thank hallelujah. You. All right, Brother Phil. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study, Lord. We thank you for giving us the word so we're getting our hearts so we might not sin against you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, just to bless all the family, Lord. Keep our children close. Keep our family members close, God. Uh, let us not forget your benefits and we Absolutely. just thank you God for everything that you do for us we need you in all aspects of our lives Lord and we ask you to uh, bless these offerings Lord not only just to give a little but to give in abundance God and we just trust you that you're going to uh, give us wealth even through our giving and we just praise you and magnify you ask you Lord just to uh, be on the minds of everybody that's in this Bible study and the ones that wanted to come and we just thank you and give you praise for all things in your son Jesus name amen Amen. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful evening and a great tomorrow.